Good morning and welcome to Sunday School this morning. We're so glad to have you. And uh, for those of you who are here in a new seat, uh, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay to, to, to have a new seat and a new position. And uh, it'll be good. It's going to be good. And so praise the Lord. For those of you who are joining us on uh, Facebook or on YouTube, our sanctuary has been rearranged this week. Excuse me. And uh, so we're, everyone's adjusting it to it as they walk in the door and, and, uh, oh, okay. If you're just getting up and anticipating coming to service, you still have time to be here live and in person at 1030. <laughs> and so uh, we're looking forward to our service today. Praise the Lord. We've been having some powerful words coming forth and some uh, wonderful opportunities for worship for those that have been coming on Wednesday nights or tuning in on Wednesday nights. We've been having some powerful, powerful prayer. And uh, once again, uh, you know, for really the last year, uh, we've been praying on, on uh, Wednesday nights. Now it's a year and three months we're into this on our Wednesday night prayer meeting. And we have seen uh, some significant results that has come up because the very things that we have been praying for on Wednesday nights, we're seeing some incredible actions. And so we know that our prayers, we're joining our prayers with the prayers of thousands of people across the United States. And so I was very excited to see uh, this week when we got up on Thursday, I believe it was, that again on a Thursday after we had prayed on Wednesday night specifically concerning this uh, uh, child abduction and child uh, trafficking, that has been taking place and really is a is a blight on the nation over this last uh, several years, but it's really come to the forefront, and we have been praying concerning that, and this uh, last Thursday, after we had prayed again specifically on Wednesday night, they had another major arrest on Thursday, and I was just like, praise the Lord, we're so happy to see that, so happy to see that that God is moving and intervening in the affairs of men because of our prayers. And so we want to continue, we want to encourage you to continue to joining us, joining us in prayer wherever you're at. And so Pastor mentioned it, I think, last week, but over the course of the last year since we've began to uh, post our, our prayer meetings and our worship uh, services and our sermons. We've had people that have joined us online from literally all across the United States at different points along the way. And so we're believing that as we prepare the Word of God and begin to teach it, it's effective not only here locally, but it's reaching those who need the message of God's love across this nation. And so Thank you for joining us. Thank you for those who are coming live and in person. I'll tell you what, these, uh, I was telling Michelle this, this week about the importance of Sunday school. <laughs> you know, uh, when, when you're, you know, just having conversation with your spouse sometimes, you know that your spouse already knows the things that you're telling them. However, you've just got to tell somebody. And so since they're the one in the room with you, <laughs> they're the one who gets the word. <laughs> and so my wife's like looking at me like, I know everything that you're telling me. <laughs> and so, uh, but, you know, it's practice. It's practice. We're, we're uh, sharpening ourselves in our, our presentation. But praise the Lord, we're, we're so happy to be able to uh, share the Word of God. And, but the point that I was making to her was that it's been so uh, exciting to me for our Sunday school. I mean, we're just 
progressively going through the New Testament. We're covering all of these epistles and all of these letters from Paul. And uh, it's important, important messages that <clears throat> I feel like there, there are many churches across the nation and even around the world who've abandoned Sunday school. They've thought, well, Sunday school is not really popular, so we're, we're not going to have Sunday school. However, it doesn't matter necessarily that it's popular. What matters is that we're teaching and presenting the Word. And so we really, we need the opposite. We need a revival of Sunday school because the Word of God, we still in America and around the world, we need the Word of God. We need the presentation of the Word of God in a understandable format where we're presenting these principles and teaching the principles of the New Testament and sharing uh, the message of God's Word so that it is a, uh, in an understandable format and it is a, uh, presented so that we can grab a hold of it and implement it in our life. And so one of the things that we wanted to talk about uh, this morning as we're, as we're beginning, you know, we are actually... We are in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. That's going to be our area of study. But as Michelle was closing last Sunday, she brought up the, uh, the message about repentance. Repentance. And I'm here to tell you that repentance is still a message that is deeply ingrained in the Word of God. And so it may have been a- abandoned by the culture that we're currently having, but that uh, irregardless of what the culture says about repentance, the Word says that repentance is important, and, it, it, and it's, a, it's a key factor in our salvation. And so all of us need to come to that, that place of repentance before God. But one of the and, and one of the main reasons that repentance is so important is for our own personal uh, mental strength so that we can have boldness, so that we can have confidence in our position in Christ. And so uh, as we were in conversation uh, again in the, you know, the, the weeks and days leading up to Michelle's uh, teaching last Sunday, uh, we had we had talked about we had heard it presented in a message, and then we had we had had conversation concerning uh, Paul's attitude. Paul's attitude. You know, Paul was so completely, completely born again that he he changed his attitude. It transformed him from top to bottom. So he he went from one who was persecuting the church, thinking he was doing the right thing, to one who received a personal revelation of Jesus Christ and a personal revelation of the truth. And when he received that truth, it totally transformed him. It totally changed him, and it was a change that was from the inside out. And so we had brought up and and uh, the Scripture that comes actually from... Uh, First, uh, from 2 Corinthians. And so I wanted to share that with you real quick. Because I think it's so important for us to be transformed in our mindset, to, uh, to be emboldened in our, in our witness for the Lord and for the kingdom. And so the scripture that I'm, I'm referring to is 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. And this is, um, in, in, this, in this short passage, Paul was addressing the Corinthians, and he was talking about repentance, and he was addressing repentance. But, uh, matter of fact, I'll go ahead and read verse 1. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And then verse 2, Open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted 
no one. We have cheated no one. And so in hearing that, in hearing that, just at, at first glance when you hear that, that is an amazing revelation of the transformation that's taken place in Paul. Because he went from one who was standing there when Stephen was stoned. He went from one who was, who was accusing and persecuting the church to one who had been so totally, so totally transformed in his mind and spirit and understanding that he knew that he was a new creation in Christ Jesus created to do good works. And so when he's coming and, and presenting this message, we've wronged no one. We've corrupted no one. We've cheated no one. When he's making this, these proclamations, if you were standing an outsider and standing back and saying, that's Paul, <laughs> that's, that's Paul. Matter of fact, when Paul first was converted and wanted to come, he, was, he had a boldness. And he wanted to come to the church and, and present the, uh, the, the, his testimony, just to share his testimony. But the church didn't trust him <laughs> because, of, because all the church was like, oh, oh, we, we know that guy. <laughs> We've seen that guy. We saw what he did. We know, he, we know what he's doing. And yet he's boldly making these proclamation here in this letter to the Corinthians that we've wronged no one. I've corrupted no one. We've cheated no one. And so it just shows the complete transformation in his life and that he had been truly born again. He had become a new creation. But just to highlight that, one of the things that... Uh, uh, Michelle, Michelle did mention last week that I really like uh, Bible Gateway. And got it right here if it didn't disappear. Here it is. And one of the features that I like in, in Bible Gateway is that when you pull up a specific uh, scripture, you can look at all the English translations of that particular scripture. And so... On this particular one, I just wanted to read two of them with you, just to share it with you, just, just for your, you know, your own understanding. And I'll talk more about that in just a minute. But here it is in the Phillips translation. This is, is Paul's words in Phillips. It says, Do make room in your hearts again for us. Not one of you has ever been wronged or ruined or cheated by us. I don't say this to condemn your attitude, but simply because, as I said before, whether we live or die, you live in our hearts. To your face, I talk to you with utter frankness, and behind your back, I talk about you with deepest pride. Whatever troubles I've gone through, the thought of you has filled me with comfort and deep happiness. So, Paul was expressing himself to the Corinthians. And just expressing his heart of compassion, his heart of love, his heart of... And, and to me, it just speaks how completely and totally he had been transformed. He had been transformed. He wasn't that, that old guy anymore. That guy was since buried in baptism. And when Paul arose, he arose a new creation. And so the other... Uh, the other translation that I thought was, uh, was really interesting, it said this, Trust us, we've never hurt a soul, never exploited or taken advantage of anyone. Don't think I'm finding fault with you. I told you earlier that I'm with you all the way, no matter what. I have, in fact, the greatest confidence in you. If only you knew how proud I am of you. I am overwhelmed with joy despite all of our troubles. And my comment on that one when I read that to Michelle was, you know, think of how many children need to hear that message from their parent. Just think about that. Did you get that message from your parent? No matter what, I have, in fact, the greatest confidence in you. If you only knew how proud I am of you, I'm overwhelmed with joy despite all of our troubles. And so Paul, I feel like that his, his parental heart was coming through 
in that in that message. And for us that are still alive and have children, we need to make sure that we've passed that message on to you. I believe in you. I have confidence in you. I know God is working in you. I believe that God is going to fulfill all of his plans and dreams for you. And so I just thought that was so interesting, but it points out how, how incredible the transformation was in Paul's own life. And the reason, the whole reason that that is so powerful, and I was considering that as I was, as I've been thinking about it in the last couple of weeks, is because of the battlefield of the mind. Because every one of us have encountered that battlefield of the mind where the enemy will come against our mind. He will try to make us doubt our salvation. He'll try to make us doubt our worth to the kingdom. And so we have to have a knowledge and an understanding of the truth of the word of God and how and, and have this revelation deeply rooted in our spirit so that we so that we have received the word, that we believe the word, and that we're living out the word in such a way that we are a living revelation of this transformation. And that's what had happened in Paul's life. And so that is the goal that we want to see happen in each and every one of you in your life and in your understanding of the word of God. And so this this week we're going to be reading from the New Living Translation in 1 Thessalonians 2. And so I wanted us to read through the, uh, the first two verses here. It says, You yourselves know, dear brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not a failure. You know how badly we had been treated at Philippi just before we came to you and how much we suffered there. Yet our God gave us the courage to declare his good news to you boldly in spite of great opposition. And so that's the first portion I want to highlight is verse 2 right there. And some of these uh, notes for the teaching notes will come from the Sparkling Gems. It's uh, one of our favorite uh, in-depth guides to the Scripture where he really breaks it down into usable, usable understanding. But it says, um, 1 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, it says, where Paul writes, but even after that, we had suffered before and were shame, shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. The phrase bold in our God to speak is from the word parousia. Paul inserts the words in our God to let us know he was so bold that only God could have enabled him to be that audacious. His preaching caused a great stir. Therefore, the verse could be translated, we were emboldened in God to publicly speak the gospel and to be very outspoken and forthright in the way we proclaimed it. Even though we were thrown into a serious fight with opposing forces that were very hostile to what we were doing and saying. Wow. Have you ever felt that way personally? <laughs> There's hostile forces out there. They're, they're hostile to what we're doing, living a Christian life, and saying, proclaiming the gospel. But what Paul is saying in this was that he had a boldness to declare the good news of the gospel that could have only come from the Holy Spirit working in his life. And every one of us, as we embrace the work of the kingdom, we can say the same thing. If we're praying, we're pursuing the Lord. I'm telling you, that is it. it the Holy Spirit can come upon you and give you a boldness to declare the gospel in such a way that, I mean, even you will realize, wow, you know, I, I was, I was, that was me speaking. But I hardly recognized myself. <laughs> Have you ever felt that way? Have, has the Holy Spirit ever come upon you in such a such a, a fashion that caused you to speak with a boldness 
And when you look back, it's like, wow, that was pretty bold. That was pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good message. <laughs> Thank you, Holy Spirit. Because <laughs> I know I couldn't have come up with all that on my own. And so, praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit is able, just as he did for Paul, to come upon you and to make you a living epistle. To encourage, to, uh, to give you a boldness to speak the gospel. A boldness to proclaim the truth and make it effective. And so... Um, he draws a parallel in, in the in the uh, in the use of the word boldness to the, to a similar passage in Hebrews, and so I wanted to share that with you as well. It says similarly, the word confidence used in Hebrews ten thirty five also refers to a very bold, frank speech, communication that is so strong, listeners may perceive the speaker to be arrogant haughty, or overconfident. So apparently the believers to whom Hebrews 10.35 was written were speaking something that was very bold and extraordinarily frank. What words were they speaking? They were speaking words of faith. Words of faith. And in your life and in my life, words of faith can be produced by the Holy Spirit working in our life. As we read the Word, study the Word, and then begin to interpret the word when we, when we speak under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We can speak words of faith that are so bold and so strong. I mean, I've heard some, some powerful messages. Have you heard Reinhard Bonnke? He has some of his messages in his prime, so powerful, so bold. Even, even Billy Graham would stand up in those uh, in those. Uh, you know, arenas with packed, I mean, just from one end to the other. And he would boldly proclaim the word of God. And one of his favorite things, he would say, the Bible says. <laughs> and so, you know what? It didn't matter what the cultural norms of the moment were. He would back to that and he would say, the Bible says. And that's what we have to do as well. We have to ignore the cultural norms of our day, those progressive leftists who are quacky. I mean, some of the things they, they produce is like, my goodness, that's the craziest stuff I've ever heard in my life. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's totally fabricated, totally fabricated lies that they produce. And so the way that we fight that is with this word right here. That's why it's so important that we know what the Bible says, starting with God created a man and a woman. <laughs> I mean, how basic is that? How basic is that? And yet this culture that we're living in is attacking the very foundation of this word, the very basic foundational truths that are found in the Word of God. And so that's why we need a boldness and a frankness that it doesn't matter what you fabricate, what you make up out of thin air. I'm standing on this Word. I'm going to have a boldness to speak the Word of God because the Word of God is true and it abides forever. And so what you have to say, what you have to say out of your carnal mind it may come and it may go, but this word endures. This word endures. So I'm going to build my life on the rock of this word. I'm going to stand on the truth. I'm going to have that foundation of the truth in my life. And, you know, that's why it's incumbent upon us to pass that foundation on to our children. And, you know, I don't know about you. Have you ever seen your children wavering from the truth? And so we need to pray for them. We need to encourage them in the word and in the truth and, it, and with the word. And so uh, let's continue. Let's be, let's be unswerving in that, that we're going to stand on the word of God. We're going to pass the word of God, and we're going to pray, Holy Spirit, give me a boldness, give me a boldness and a frankness to 
share the truth with this generation, with every generation that comes after me. So praise the Lord. But it's so powerful. It says, why did they need to hang on and continue believing and speaking words of faith? The verse tells us why. Because their confidence, their bold confessions of faith had great recompense of reward. And so that's true for you and I. So I wanted to share, this was his interpretation. It says, God wanted those Hebrew Christians to know, and I'm telling you this today, he wants you to know this word right here. It says, I know what you've done to serve me. I'm aware of the time, the energy, the effort, the work, and the money you have spent to do the job I sent you to do. Go ahead and tally up what's owed you and boldly declare that you will be reimbursed. I will see to it that you recoup everything you spent along the way. You'll get everything that you've spent and that you've been declaring by faith. That's a bold word. That's a bold word because the devil will come and attack us and he'll attack our mind and say, you know, why are you still, why are you still teaching and preaching the word of truth? Why are you still preaching that word when the culture is going this other direction? And so we just have to have that boldness in our life and say, I don't care where the culture is going to go. I'm going to follow what this word says. I'm going to allow this word to transform my mind and my spirit, and I'm going to stick with this. This is my map. This is my guidebook. This is my, my uh, compass in this world where things may be up one day and down the next. And yet the word of God remains. So I want to encourage you. Continue, continue to live for Jesus and declare his word. Let's look on verse 3. It says, so you can see we were not preaching with any deceit or impure motives or trickery. And so I do want to highlight that, you know, Paul is, is speaking to a, a group of people that he had a relationship with, a relationship. And so uh, verse 4 for we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the motives of our heart. He alone examines the motives of our heart. And so I want to bring this in in conjunction with that specifically because, I mean, that, as I mentioned earlier, the... the um, the enemy of our soul will attack our purpose. He will come and attack us for the good things, even the good things that we have done in the past. And so I want to, uh, to share this, and it really comes across as a devotional, but it's all surrounding this passage in 1 Thessalonians 2.4. But listen to this. Have you ever wondered, God, how long am I going to have to wait for that pro promotion? Is there a reason that the promotion I want keeps getting delayed? What is happening in my life, Lord? <laughs> I think we can all raise our hand, you know, whether it's a promotion or something else that we've prayed for. We always seem concerned about making things happen faster, but God doesn't work in the same time frame we do. We can all say amen to that in the last five months. There are some things that are more important to God than giving us a promotion when we want it or making sure we get a pay raise when we think we deserve it. God, God does reward us for our faithfulness. But sometimes he takes a little longer than we might like to promote us in order to make sure we're really ready for that next big assignment. It's hard on the, on the flesh while we wait, yet it is actually the mercy of God at work. You see, during that time of waiting, the imperfections that would have ruined us are exposed so God can remove them. Then he can make us, he can move us up into the new position with no concern that a hidden flaw will cause us to fall flat on our face. We know from Acts chapter 9, verse 20 through 25, that when Paul first became a Christian, he tried to barge right into a public ministry. But he wasn't ready for that yet and therefore created some problems and a lack of peace in the early church. 
I made reference to that earlier. Yeah, that guy that was persecuting the church wants to come preach next Sunday. What do y'all think? (laughs) Although saved and called, he simply wasn't ready to be promoted into such a visible position of leadership. It was going to take some time for God to prepare Paul for the kind of ministry and anointing he was going to carry in his life. So for us, looking back, we can, we can see that clearly. I mean, that's so clearly. You know, Paul was transformed on the road to, to Damascus. He was, he was transformed. He was changed that day in a moment in a vision of Jesus. And he was called. And yet, it took some time for that calling to play out. It took some time for him to mature into the position of ministry that he was to assume. And like I said, also, we, we can see the result. We can see the result because we're looking back and we can see that because he matured into that position, because God took the time to mold and, and prepare him and place him in the ministry, then we see that he was very effective because he wrote all of these letters to the, all these epistles and, you know, half of the New Testament. <laughs> and so we see that he was effective and he was transformed and he was changed, but it took some time. It took, took some time for that to happen. It was going to take some time for God to prepare Paul for the kind of ministry and anointing he was to carry in this life. Paul referred to this process when he wrote to first to the Thessalonians. He said, but as we were allowed of God to put in trust, to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. This verse is packed full of insight regarding Paul's own experience of being prepared, tested, and finally promoted into his public ministry. Notice first that Paul says, but as we were allowed of God, the word allowed is the the Greek word, that's a really tough one for me, dokumazado, a word that means to test in examine, to examine, to inspect, to scrutinize, to determine the quality of or sincerity of a thing. Because the object scrutinized has passed the test, it can now be viewed as genuine and sincere. And so... This word was also used to illustrate the test used to determine real and counterfeit coinage. Think about that. After a scrutinizing test was performed, the bona fide coin, coinage would stand up to the test and the counterfeit would fail. The strictness, the strictness conveyed by, the, by this word is evident by an early use of this word to picture the refining of metal by fire to remove impurities. First, the metal was placed in a fire that burned at a certain degree of heat. Then it was placed in a fire burning at an even higher degree. And finally, it was placed in a blazing fire that burned at the highest degree of all. You feel like you've been there? (laughs) You feel like that in your life, have you ever experienced that? Experienced that you were placed in the heat and burned some stuff off. And then, instead of that being it, The heat got turned up a little bit. Wow. Then you're going, wow. And it buff a little more stuff. And then you think, oh, man, I made it through that. And what happens? The heat gets turned up again. (laughs) How does this even happen? But it's for our good and that it gets those impurities out. It burns out. The blazing fire that burned at the highest degree of all. Three such tests were needed in order to remove from the metal all the unseen impurities that were hidden from the naked eye. And so, you know, how well do we know ourselves? Sometimes we think, okay, I'm ready. (laughs) I'm ready, and then we get in traffic in Houston. (laughs) And uh, I had a great illustration, but I won't use it this week for from uh, that Michelle had told me about because it's somebody we know but <laughs> but you know sometimes that Houston traffic can can 
tempt your, tempt your mouth to say things that maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> and so, is the Houston traffic enough to uh, bring out any impurities in your soul? <laughs> I'm saying that as a, uh, as a uh, comical illustration, but it's so true. You know, there's, there's things that we go through that, that will bring out some things that are inside sometimes that we didn't know were there or we forgot were there, you know, placed it on the back burner. And so sometimes when the heat gets turned up, it brings out those impurities. So it says, from the viewpoint of the naked eye, the metal probably looks strong and ready, ready to be used even prior to those tests. But unseen defects were resident in the metal that would have shown up later as a break or a fracture, or some kind of malfunction. So in our lives, we need to take that to heart and realize that sometimes when God turns up the heat in our life to get those imperfections out, it's for our good. It's so that later on, a break or a fracture or some kind of malfunction will be avoided. So before a person can be assured that the metal was free of defects, thus ready to be used. These three purifying tests at three different degrees of blazing hot fire were required. The fire was hot, the process was lengthy, but the tests were necessary in order to achieve the desired result. So we may feel like that sometimes in our life. The fire's hot, the process is lengthy, but God knows what he's doing. He's bringing us through that fire I like that crab family song, Through the Fire. God's bringing us through the fire. And for us, fortunately, we haven't been uh, tested in the fire to the point of those three Hebrew children who actually got thrown into the literal fire. Fortunately, there was a fourth man there that wrapped his arms of protection around them and protected them even in the midst of the burning heart fire that had been turned up hotter than ever before, and so you may feel that sometime in your life that it's like that. It was a lengthy process, and I went through a lot of refining fires to get to this place, but finally I passed the test, and God saw that I was genuinely ready. That's what Paul was saying. That's what he's declaring in this verse 4. I was, it was a lengthy process, and I went through a lot of refining fires to get to this place, but finally I passed the test, and God saw that I was genuinely ready. So that's what we're looking for in our life. We want to come to that place where it's like, Lord, I want to pass the test. I want to come. I want to be genuinely ready for use in your kingdom, for use in your, in your service, for kingdom service. And so help me, Lord. Help me, Holy Spirit. Touch me, Holy Spirit. Drive those impurities out of my life and help me to be that, that vessel that is prepared for your usage. So don't be discouraged if it takes time for your dream to become a reality in your life. God never gets in a hurry because godly character is more important to him than gifts, than talents, or temporary success in the eyes of others. He wants to use you, but he also wants you to be ready to be used. Wow. That's a, uh, a frank way to put it, and yet it's sobering for each of us to realize, Lord, I want to be that vessel that you can have confidence in, that you can use, that, that, can, be, that can be useful for the kingdom to the degree that Paul was. What about that? To the degree that Paul transformed the then known world. So right now you may need some time to prepare, change, and grow. That way, when God finally promotes you, you'll have what you need, both naturally and spiritually, to stay established in that God-ordained position as you fulfill your assignment with excellence. So that's challenging, and yet we know that in the midst of all the things that we go through, God is working. God is working. And so, um, let's continue reading. 
because I want to get on down to this next part because it really discusses, uh, we're going to discuss about Paul's attitude toward, toward those that he was ministering with and, and the degree of love that he shows. So in verse 5, it says, Never once did we try to win you with flattery, as you well know. And God is our witness that we were not pretending to be your friends just to get your money as for human praise. We have never sought it from you or anyone else. Verse 7, think about this. As apostles of Christ, we certainly had a right to make some demands of you, but instead we were like children among you. Or we were like a mother feeding and caring for her own child. We loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. Don't you remember, dear brothers and sisters, how hard we worked among you? Night and day we toiled to earn a living so that we would not be a burden to any of you as we preached God's good news to you. You you yourselves are our witnesses, and so is God, that we were devout and honest and faultless toward all of you believers. And you know that we treated each of you as a father treats his own children. We pleaded with you, encouraged you, and urged you to live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy, for he called you to share in his kingdom and glory. Therefore, we never stop thanking God that when you received this message from us, you didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, which, of course, it is, and this word continues to work in you who believe. And then, dear brothers and sisters, you suffered persecution from your own countrymen. In this way, you imitated the believers in God's churches in Judea, who, because of their belief in Christ, suffered from their own people, the Jews. For some of the Jews killed the prophets, and some even killed the Lord Jesus. Now they have persecuted us too. They fail to please God and work against all humanity as they try to keep us from preaching the good news of salvation to the Gentiles. By doing this, they continue to pile up their sins, but the anger of God has caught up with them at last. And so there's a portion of this I want to to point out a couple things about Paul's love for this people. He had gone there. He had spent time there. And so he loved this, this people. He had labored among them. And so he shared, he's saying he shared not only the gospel, but he shared his very life with them. He shared his life. And so in doing so, he's, he's presenting a model. He's presenting a model for the modern day church and that we don't want to just share the word. We don't want to just tell somebody. We want to share our life. We want to live out the gospel among those that we minister to. So in this, it says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, Paul describes his relationship to the church in terms of the relationship that exists between a mother and a child. But in verse 11, he paints a different side of his ministry toward the church. Here, Paul is taking on the role of a father in their lives. So at first he comes and and he says, I was like a child among you. And that's saying that he, he was doing no harm. He was innocent in the way that he presented himself. And then he, he presents his love as being one who loved and cherished like a mother. He cherished these people and he loved them with compassion and mercy like a mother. And then finally in verse 11, he presents, he presents another side. It says, uh, Paul was saying that you can't be a mother all the time in ministry. Sometimes you have to feel a fatherly role. He was implying that there's a time to cuddle. <laughs> we love that time, Jesus. Wrap me in your arms. Oh, hallelujah. And a time to spank. Whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> a time to care and caress and a time to correct. In a spiritual sense, Paul had taken on the roles of both mother and father in the lives of the Thessalonians believers. So in verse 11, we see how this fatherly ministry of Paul functioned. First, Paul exhorted the people. This is the Greek, Greek word, parakalio. Next, he comforted them, another Greek word. Finally, he charged them. It says the word charged is the Greek word 
Marta Romeo. My Greek's not very well. <laughs> However, the meaning of it is what we're after. It says the three words mean three different things, and they are all very important. First, I want you to notice that the Greek word translated as exhorted and comforted both begin with the word para, which indicates relationship. Relationship. Although Paul was speaking here to an older group of the church, he was still by their side, continually exhorting them, walking with them, teaching them, and speaking to them. That was Paul of Paul, part of Paul's ministry, even for those who were more spiritually mature. So I think that he's setting an example. He's setting an example to the church for pastors. And so fortunately for us as a congregation, we have a pastor and his wife who lives this out and that they've been in this church ministering the word, but they also lived their life before us. They lived their life with us. They come and they pray with us on Wednesdays. Yesterday, as they went out to pray for the community, our pastor and his wife went out to pray for the community. And so they're modeling the word before us. And so that becomes important for each of us to realize and to see so that we can imitate that, so we can do the same thing in our home with our children and with those that we influence. We want to share the word with them, but we also want to, to live the life before them. So it says, when Paul performed his fatherly ministry, he exhorted, he comforted. And for the comfort carries the idea that even if your father can't physically be at your side, you should still live in a godly manner he taught you. And so we take that from our earthly father, and we even more need to imp implement that in our life from our spiritual fathers. Paul was calling the believers to a lifestyle of responsibility. Now, some of them were grown. They were responsible to live the Christian life and a life that was honoring and pleasing to God. And so, you know, it's that... <clears throat> It's that uh, message that we pass on to our children, that children, even if I'm not there, I expect you to act right. And so then when we hear a report coming back from, from a family that our, our child went and spent some time with, and they, say, they come back and tell us, oh, your child was a little angel. They listened to me. They did everything I asked them to do. They cleaned up after themselves. And we're just like, that's my Johnny. <laughs> sometimes we may be a little more shocked than that when it's like whoa I'm so glad to hear that so we'll expect the same thing at our house now <laughs> but no that's what we want is we want to teach our children and have it translate into their life in the way that they act when they're not around their parents and the same thing is true in the spiritual sense of as pastor presents the word and the word goes into you in your life, then you go out of the four walls of the church, then what do you produce? You produce the fruit of the word of God in your life so that you're sharing that word, you're sharing that gospel, you're sharing that message, and you're living a godly life. And so that's what all of us as parents, we want to see that reproduced in our children. And as spiritual parents and spiritual men and women, we want to see that reproduced in the life of other people others that we introduce to the kingdom. And so that's the circular motion of the kingdom in action. And it is so important for us to uh, implement that in the church because we want to be a healthy church. And a healthy church is reproducing, reproducing. And so we need spiritual fruit in the body and we need spiritual fruit outside the walls. And so I know that we, we uh, have seen this in the past in, our, in the activities of our church and our fellowship that we're influencing and, and affecting people outside the walls of this church, and we want to continue to see that. And we want to see the multiplication take place to the point that it fills up this sanctuary, but then that the, the reproduction continues to take place outside the sanctuary so that we're doing good deeds, bold deeds and daring acts of sharing the gospel, sharing the truth wherever we go so that when we go to 
Montrose and, and feed the homeless physically, we also want to feed them spiritually and share the good news with them. And so uh, we see over time where that's had an effect. That's, we see people saved off of the street, and we hear good reports of, of children and babies saved off the street from a ministry that we're involved on, involved in. And that, that like gives you a boldness and to continue to do that, to do that ministry. And so in the past where we've gone and Kath has taken youth and young people and gone and done random acts of kindness for homes and for families and widows and different ones that were in need at different times, it's been a blessing to those families. And uh, for the young people who were involved in them at the time, it made a mark on their life that continues. And so we want to see the reproduction of the gospel continue in our life, in our fellowship, in this body. And so we just continue, Lord, let us see, let us see the, the uh, continuation of this in our life and in our ministry. All right, the, uh, as we're closing, I want us to uh, look at this scripture in 1 Thessalonians 2.18. Let's look at that real quick. It says, uh, well, I'll read 17 down. Dear brothers and sisters, after we, were, after we were separated from you for a little while, though our hearts never left you, we tried very hard to come back because of our intense longing to see you. We wanted very much to come to you, and I, Paul, tried again and again, but Satan prevented us. After all, what gives us hope and joy and what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus Christ when he returns. It is you. Yes, you are our pride and joy. You are our pride and joy. That reminds me of Brother Dearman. <laughs> if you ever asked him, uh, can I see your pride and joy? He'd had to pull his wallet out. And he'd go through this whole process. He'd pull it out and he'd flip through his photos and he'd pull out a photo and he had a photo of pride and joy to uh, kitchen cleaners. <laughs> but he loved to do it. He loved to, uh, to, to do that to people. But here Paul is saying, my pride and joy, you are my pride and joy. And the thing that we want to really, to really understand about this was that Paul had been there. He had shared in ministry. He had shared in their life. He had, he had uh, ministered to them, shared the gospel with them, saw the fruit in their life, and he wanted to come back. And it says that he tried once, and then he tried again. And that was one of the things that he was longing to do. But one of the things that, that is so important for us to see is that we see Satan had used a spiritual tactics against Paul, and he says this specifically, Satan hindered me. He said he hindered me. And this is something, this is a spiritual uh, tactic that the enemy still uses in our lives and, and, and tries to hinder us from fulfilling our ministry and fulfilling our calling. And so I, I want to uh, bring out a few things on this in the remaining time, these uh, next few minutes. It says, have you ever pursued something that you believed was God's will, yet obstacles seem to keep you from doing what you thought was you were supposed to do? If you have, don't feel alone, because many people have been at the same position. Even the Apostle Paul felt this way, but what should you do in times like these? So today we want to notice that word hindered and it says it was an old word that was originally used to describe a road so deteriorated and broken up that it was impassable have you ever driven down a road on your way to your destination only to discover that the road you're driving on was too full of ruts and holes to continue as a result you have to turn around go back find another route to get where you're going well, that's exactly what happened uh, to Paul. And uh, Michelle and I have a perfect illustration of that because we were following the 
road map that was on our phone one time. We went to Alabama. We're, we don't know anything about this place where we're going except that it's a destination on the map. So we're following the map very closely. We turn down the road, and we're going down a perfectly, perfectly good road, wonderful road, kind of rock. Yeah, it did. It did at the end. Now I remember that. It kind of got rocky. Then it got maybe like turned into just like a dirt road, and it was, but it's on our map. So we're just continuing on until the bridge wasn't there. <clears throat> there was, we saw the place where we were supposed to go across this big crevice. <laughs> it was down in the road. So we just couldn't get there on this road. So we had to turn around, go back, backtrack, go all the way around and go a different route. And so that happens sometimes in life because Satan tries to hinder us. He tries to keep us from fulfilling our, our destination. Says Paul uses this word to describe hindering forces that kept him from going to see the Thessalonians. Says no doubt that's what uh, this is what Paul means. Paul was on his way to see them not once, he says, but twice. But the journey became so filled with danger and unexpected bumps that Paul had to turn around, go back, and rethink his strategy on how he was going to get to the church at Thessalonica. So can you think of a time when you've encountered something like this in your journey? says, um, says, this is clean, means that Paul understood Satan's tactic. The enemy had tried to make use of dangerous and unexpected bumps along the way to throw Paul off track and to elbow him out of his spiritual race. In fact, Paul was convinced that Satan had specifically engineered these unforeseen and unanticipated hassles to keep him from getting to the Thessalonian church. And so, as I was reading that, I thought, yep, yep, Satan still used that tactic. He still is trying to do that. And so, what uh, the picture that it painted was two, two guys in a race. And one of the guys, as they were coming up, and one guy was about to pass him, the, the one guy elbows him to keep him from passing him and knocks him off course. And so, they said it was... Uh, he was running alongside the runner and literally elbows him out of the race with aggression toward a fellow runner. And so uh, we have to be prepared and mentally and emotionally prepared that the enemy doesn't fight fair. And so realizing that, that there are times where the enemy will specifically try to hinder us on the way. And, so, and yet we have to have a mindset that says, I'm going to go through. I'm going to, I'm determined, I'm going to go through for the kingdom. And so if somebody elbows me and throws me off balance, I'm going to get back up and keep on going. Get back up and keep on going. I don't know if y'all saw the, uh, I saw two memes this last week. One was the, uh, the young girl, she's, she looks like a young girl, maybe 19, 20 years old with one leg. And uh, I put it on my Facebook. She's, she's, does the clean and jerk. So that's basically she takes the barbell, lifts it to her chest, and then lifts it over her head. She had one leg, and she, she lifted it up, pulled it up to her chest, and then she did a couple squats, and then she lifted it up over her head. I thought, that's determination right there. That is determination. She, she was not going to quit even though she was according to some people, handicapped, okay? So she had determination in her life. Another one was a runner from, from England, from the U.K. He was in the, uh, the, the U.K.'s version of the Marines. I can't remember exactly what they called him, but he was a, a British soldier, and he had lost his legs, and he was... Uh, uh, he had replacement legs, basically mechanical replacements. And so they, I mean, from his, from pretty much his hips down, he had these uh, legs on that were just like put on his, and he was basically bouncing. He was bouncing down the road on these mechanical legs. And then I didn't notice until he fell down. He fell down. 
And when he fell down, then I noticed not only did he have, had he lost two legs, but he had lost an arm. So he had one arm and had those two mechanical legs. And the guy that was out there with him came over and checked on him and then kind of stood back. And the guy with one arm was able to get back up on his feet. And I was like, Jesus, that is, that is amazing. That is incredible that this man had that kind of determination that he wasn't going to allow these circumstances to keep him down. Even when he fell down, he got back up on his own, on his own, without, without the other guy intervening, without the other guy lifting him up. But he had pro progressed to that place that even when he fell down, he got back up on his own. So I was like, thank you, Lord. That's an amazing miracle right there, just to see that he's continuing on. He's moving on. And so in, the, in the, the service of our king, we have to have a determination that we're not going to be dis, d, hindered or we're not going to be dis, dissuaded from our purpose, even though there are times we will be hindered. So let's close with prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it comes forth in a, in a way that speaks to our heart, that speaks to our life. And we pray that you will give us a determination that we will move forward for the kingdom, that we will not allow uh, the enemy to hinder us to the point of making us quit. But we will be determined that we're going to follow after you. We're going to live for the kingdom. We're going to stand on the word and the promises of God. And we will overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. We praise you today for all that you're at work doing. We pray that you'll be glorified in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Join us at 1030 for the morning worship. Thanks.